Thank you for tuning in to the 100th episode of our SpaceX Weekly Updates. Whether you've been with us from the beginning or you joined somewhere along the way, we want to thank you for your support and for making this series possible. We here at Lab Padre are dedicated to bringing you the no-nonsense Starship coverage you've come to expect, and we look forward to delivering more new and exciting content in the future. And with that, let's dig into episode 100. Starting off this week on Friday morning, one of the columns for the next orbital launch tower was lifted and placed onto the assembly jig at Sanchez. While most of the tower is expected to be built from the already assembled sections from Florida, the top sections are still in pieces. Around the same time the column was being lifted, over at the ring yard, Booster 10's hot staging ring was spotted coming out of the Star Factory. The article was then moved through the ring yard and staged outside of Mega Bay 1 to await reinstallation atop Booster 10. Meanwhile, the first section of the new door for Mega Bay was installed and raised to the top of the doorway. The door will be comprised of fabric sections that will fold together as the door raises. A little over an hour after being placed onto the assembly jig, the tower column was removed from the base and laid back onto the ground. It's not yet clear if this was just a test fit or if something was wrong with the install. By late morning, preparations were complete and Booster 10's hot staging ring was moved out of the staging area and into Mega Bay 1 for remounting to the Super Heavy. Then, about an hour and a half later, one of the bridge cranes lifted the hot staging ring and placed it on top of Booster 10 once again. It's not known what work will be done while the section was removed, but hopefully it is now ready for flight. Nearby at the Star Factory expansion, HVAC units were being installed onto the roof of the final section of the previous phase of the building. Meanwhile, work continues at a steady pace on other areas of the Star Factory expansion. Concrete trucks are a regular sight as workers continue to place foundations and floor slabs for the next areas of the building. Steel workers also remain busy installing new steel along the front of the building near Highway 4. A Spartan Crane Services Liber LRT-1090 was spotted on a pair of trailers along Highway 4 near the Star Factory. With all activity going on around Starbase lately, additional cranes are often needed to help carry the workload. At the Orbital Tank Farm, work continues on the installation of the new large diameter piping that will be used to redirect the nitrogen boil-off from the liquid oxygen subcoolers. Friday night, back at the build site, Ship 28 was once again moved out of High Bay. The ship was moved out of the building's doorway and temporarily parked in the middle of the drive lane. Then, the new stand for the two-point ship lifter was moved into the building. A short time later, the stand re-emerged from the building, this time with the ship lifter loaded onto it. On Saturday morning, after a week of demolition and rebuilding, crews were once again ready to pour the walls for the new building at the pad. The pour continued through the morning and appeared to go off without a hitch this time. That afternoon, SpaceX's GMK-7550 was packed up and prepared for a move. The crane and its counterweights then moved down Highway 4 and turned back into the launch complex through the recently rebuilt D-1 gate. Several hours later, Ship 28 was briefly rolled onto Highway 4 before turning down Remedios Avenue on its way to the Rocket Garden. That evening, the Buckner LR-1750 in the Rocket Garden lifted Ship 26 off the engine installation stand and transferred it to the awaiting transport stand. Once secured and released from the crane, the Starship was moved over to its previous spot in the garden. Then, overnight, the crane was connected to Ship 28. Once secured to the crane with the two-point lifter, the Integrated Flight Test 3 Starship was lifted off of its transport stand and placed onto the engine installation stand. On Sunday morning, the GMK-7550 was back to work, this time at the test stand tank farm. One of the gray vertical tanks was removed and placed onto an SPMT. Then, as the SPMT left the launch site and headed up Highway 4, a new replacement tank was put in its place. As the old tank made its way up the road, the SPMT appeared to suffer a breakdown. In short order, however, the problem seemed to be fixed and the tank once again began moving up Highway 4. The tank continued on past the build site before eventually arriving at Massey's outpost. Meanwhile, down Highway 4 at the build site, another GMK-7550 was busy at the Star Factory expansion. The recently delivered crane was being used to install additional HVAC units onto the roof of the building. 
Nearby, the installed door section on Mega Bay 1 was lowered back down to the bottom of the building. At the bottom, the door was removed. It's not yet clear if this was an issue or if this was just some type of initial test fit of the door. Overnight, work continued on the new exoskeleton being added to the backside of the freshly exposed vertical water and nitrogen tanks at the orbital tank farm. Additional horizontal ribs were then added between the vertical columns on the water tank where the dents had recently been pulled out. On Monday morning, the A-frame was spotted being lifted and installed back onto the LR-11000 at the launch site. With the reassembly of the crane now underway, it looks like it will not be leaving the launch site as many had previously speculated. At the Sanchez site, the first of the two relatively small vertical liquid storage tanks was picked up by a crane and moved over onto a new prepared base next to the generator building. Nearby at the Rocket Garden, crews were busy actively working on two different starships. Over at one of the parking spots in the garden, Ship 26 continued to have work done on the recently installed stringers on the vehicle's payload bay. Recently, a lot of focus has been on adding smaller connecting stringers between the three previously installed rows. Meanwhile, on the engine installation stand, Ship 28 remained connected to the crane by the two-point ship lifter. Presumably, crews were busy in the vehicle's skirt, likely preparing to swap at least one of the engines. Next door in Mega Bay 1, the recent removal of the door section gave a peek at the top of Booster 10, now once again with its hot stage ring installed on top of it. Next to the Star Factory expansion, a new project looks to be taking shape. The large lot at the corner of Highway 4 and San Martin Boulevard has recently been cleared and is now being dewatered. This seems to indicate that SpaceX is planning significant work in the area. Could this be the site of the new six-level parking garage? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Around noon, the second of the beige-colored vertical tanks was lifted and moved into position at the Sanchez site. It is not immediately clear what these will be used for. They could be water tanks or possibly diesel tanks for that standby generator. As the day continued, so did the work on the reassembly of the LR-11000. This crane being readied for reassembly has become much more important since it became apparent that Ship 28 was in need of engine work. As a result, another static fire will likely be needed before the next integrated flight test. By Monday, the concrete walls for the new building at the launch site seemed to have had enough time to cure and the forms were removed. This time, the walls look good and crews should be able to push forward once again with the building's construction. Over behind the orbital tank farm, the new blast wall continues to grow. As the new prefabricated pieces come in, they are lifted and added to the wall and will serve to protect the farm from the fury of a launch. At the liquid oxygen subcoolers, the new boil-off piping appears to be mostly completed. We can now see that the purpose of the piping will be to redirect the nitrogen boil off away from the farm and dump it over the new blast wall. Nearby, the new water tank and associated piping have all been insulated and the pipes jacketed to help harden them for launches. Over behind the most recently installed horizontal cryo tanks, the form work to extend the berm wall has now been installed. This wall extends from the berm behind the vertical part of the tank farm, but is just a wall and not a berm. This is likely to keep the path wide enough to move boosters and ships to the mount. In Mega Bay 2, legs for a second ship engine installation stand were seen in the center of the back row of the building. A second lift table, floor, and top mounting ring are currently at the Sanchez site awaiting installation. As dust fell over Starbase, the chopsticks began to climb the launch tower. They were raised high enough to clear the launch mount, and the right chopstick was swung out to leave Mechazilla's arm fully opened. Then, shortly after 8 o'clock local time, SpaceX performed a retraction test on both the booster and ship quick disconnects. About an hour later, the quick disconnects were tested again. SpaceX may be experimenting with the timing of these retractions given the damage to the ship quick disconnect during the last launch. After the test, the chopsticks were closed and lowered back to the base of the tower and the quick disconnect arm was rotated back into its resting position. Meanwhile, back up the road at the build site, an SPMT arrived in the ring yard carrying two booster CO2 pressure tanks, probably from the inventory tent area. Then, working overnight, the two tanks were lifted one at a time and moved into Mega Bay 1. 
Inside the building, the tanks were installed onto Booster 13. On Tuesday morning, a concrete pump truck was spotted at the launch site, placing the concrete for the berm wall extension. Around 9 o'clock, the still-assembled majority of the main boom for the LR-11000 was reinstalled onto the base of the boom as reassembly of the crane continues to push forward. At the Massey's outpost, the vertical tank that was removed from the test stand tank farm two days earlier was lifted and installed as the fit-out of the test site continues. Over at the build site, the first part of the new door for Mega Bay 1 was once again installed and raised to the top of the bay. Workers followed the door up, meeting it at the top where they likely worked to complete the installation of the section. Back down at the launch site, with the boom on the LR-11000 once again fully assembled, workers reinstalled the pendants. These connect the tip of the boom to the A-frame to enable the boom to be raised. The counterweight backpack was also reinstalled on the crane, another necessity for raising the boom for this configuration of an LR-11000. With all the heavy lifting done in the reassembly of the LR-11000, the GMK-7550 transferred its own counterweights to a waiting SPMT, then headed out of the launch site on its way to Sanchez. One of the smaller cranes remained behind to help crews finalize the reassembly of the LR-11000. Nearby at the orbital tank farm, crews were spotted installing another prefabricated section of piping. These sections of piping were assembled in the short-lived fabrication building that sat at the corner of San Martin and Highway 4. At Mega Bay 2, several purlins were seen being lifted and installed onto the building's roof. These went onto the front center of the roof, which was the final remaining open area. That afternoon, the first section of the Mega Bay door was tested as it was lowered down, closing the top part of the doorway. Overnight, workers did some raptor swappings between the Mega Bays. Shortly before midnight, a sea level raptor was spotted moving from Mega Bay 2 to Mega Bay 1. A short time later, another raptor was spotted going the opposite direction, likely heading for installation on Ship 29. On Wednesday morning, a sea level raptor was spotted moving away from Ship 28 in the Rocket Garden, likely having just been removed from the ship. Looking closely, we could then see a telehandler lift the engine off the installation stand. Later, another engine was brought over and placed onto the stand. A little after 10 o'clock, the second section of the door for Mega Bay 1 was raised up the doorway. Part of the way up, it met the bottom of the first section and then they continued upward together, heading for the top. The latest phase of the Star Factory expansion continues to progress. The steel for the front section of the building is being installed at a good pace and installation has begun on the roof structure connecting it to the previous phase of the building. Early in the afternoon, a second sea level raptor was spotted heading into Mega Bay 2 for an installation on Ship 29. Down at the launch site, with workers standing by on top of the launch mount, the booster quick disconnect was closed. Back up Highway 4 at the Rocket Garden, the sea level raptor that was brought out earlier in the day was moved from the staging area and taken over to the engine installation stand for integration with Ship 28. Wednesday afternoon, the LR-11000's boom remained lowered, although the structure was fully reassembled. The next task for the workers will be to reeve the cable for both the main block as well as the auxiliary hook before the crane will be ready to return to work. At the orbital tank farm, workers have begun painting the newly installed exoskeletons to match the tanks they are protecting. Meanwhile, crews are putting final touches on the installation of the new redirection piping for the nitrogen boil-off from the liquid oxygen subcoolers. At the orbital launch tower, crews were spotted adding plug welds over the bolt connections that hold the new protective plates onto the base of the tower. Workers are now preparing for the concrete roof to be added onto the new building at the launch site. The area is being staged with a heavy-duty shoring that will support the framework and eventually the concrete on top of them as it cures, just as was seen recently with the new guardhouse. On Thursday morning, one of the steel columns for the new launch tower was once again lifted and placed onto one of the bases of the tower section assembly jig. Similar to what we saw last time, the leg remained in place for roughly an hour before it was lifted back off the base and placed onto the ground. Crews were once again up on lifts working on the new door for Mega Bay 1. It appears that they were working to connect the first two sections of the door together. 
At the launch site, it appears that all of the precast panels for the new blast wall have now been placed. Next, we should see concrete being poured in the area to tie all the sections together. Nearby, workers were spotted continuing the installation of the heavy-duty shoring in preparation for the poured concrete roof for the new building by the Flame Deflector Tank Farm. Also, the form work was being removed from the newly poured extension of the berm wall. Switching to Florida on Friday afternoon, drone ship a short fall of Gravitas was spotted being towed out to sea in support of the Starlink Group 6-38 launch. Several hours later, Bob followed the drone ship out to sea in support of fairing recovery operations for that same launch. Two days later, on Sunday evening, that mission launched as Falcon 9 Booster 1062 lit up the Florida skies and sent another 23 Starlinks to orbit from Launch Complex 39A. Our Cape Cam tracking footage caught some beautiful views of the second stage burning through the night sky. Just after noon on Tuesday, SpaceX launched the CRS-NG-20 mission atop Booster 1077, sending Northrop Grumman's Cygnus craft on its way to the space station. This is the first of three Cygnus launches on SpaceX's manifest and required a modification to the fairing. To allow for late loading of sensitive cargo, it was necessary to add an access hatch to the fairing. Eight minutes later after launch, Booster 1077 came falling back out of the Florida skies as it lit its engines and touched down at landing zone one. Just before midnight, Bob returned to port, carrying both of the recovered fairing halves from Sunday's Starlink mission. The next morning, Bob was headed back out of Port Canaveral once again. The fairing recovery vessel headed towards Charleston to pick up the fairings that Doug recovered from the Cygnus launch, allowing Doug to pick up just read the instructions from the shipyard. Late that afternoon, a short fall of Gravitas was towed back into Port Canaveral with Falcon 9 Booster 1062 following its 18th successful launch. On Thursday morning, one of the full height sections of the next launch tower was delivered to the dock area near NASA's Vehicle Assembly Building. Since our last flyover update, the section has been painted, had the cable tray installed up one of the side of the back legs, and had some piping installed. Given what we can see, it seems likely that this is Section 3. That night, another prefabricated section was also moved to the dock area. If construction is consistent with what we have seen previously, the two sheaves that were recently installed on this section to redirect the drawworks cable would indicate that this is section 6 of the next Starbase launch tower. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.